So I've seen a bunch of research about sauna. I've seen a bunch of research about cold exposure. Contrast therapy, which is huge here in Austin, going from sauna to cold. And it seems like 20 and three, Mm -hmm. three rounds is very typical. Is there something that we're gaining or something that we're losing by doing that cycle rather than doing a block of heat and a block of cold separately? Not that I'm aware of, but you know, the, we finally have some good science to put to this. And unfortunately it wasn't from my lab. This is the beautiful work of Susanna Soberg, who's over in Scandinavia, published a paper in Cell Reports Medicine showing that the threshold you're trying to hit each week is at least, you can do more, but at least 11 minutes of uncomfortable but safe cold exposure per week total. So that could be three minutes Monday, three minutes Wednesday, so yep. so on, to 11 minutes and 57 minutes per week minimum <laughs> so, so of precise. sauna. That's what they found. <laughs> What did they find? Increases brown fat thermogenesis, thereby metabolism, thereby comfort being, you know, in cold, et cetera. Um, Clearly there's a resilience effect. Clearly there's a dopamine increasing effect. And clearly you can do more. You could do all that in one day or you could spread it out throughout the week or you could do more. It kind of depends on what you're shooting for. How cold? People always say, how cold, how hot? Well, for heat, is generally uh, between 187 degrees Fahrenheit and 212 degrees Fahrenheit somewhere in that range. And for cold, it's cold enough that you really want to get the hell out, but that you can stay in safely because I don't want anyone to kill themselves with doing this stuff. Did I see you say that um, evening time heat exposure increases growth hormone release by 16 times or something insane, but subsequent sessions of the same only increase it by a very small margin? Yes. Am I talking out of my ass? No, you're absolutely right. So we can we can delineate some protocols. If you want to get better, more resilient, cold exposure is going to be great anytime. Post cold exposure, your body is going to heat up. Think of your body heating up as waking up. So if you are concerned about not being able to sleep, then I would suggest you do your cold exposure earlier in the day, right? Heat does the opposite. So I'm laying out some parameters here. Heat does the opposite. You're going to heat up while you're in the deliberate heat exposure. But afterwards, there's a post heating dip in temperature. We can talk. This was all covered in an episode I did with Dr. Craig Heller on thermogenesis. Gets a little bit down in the weeds, but take my word for it. If you want to get the science, you can go there to find the science behind this. So sauna at night is great as well. Now let's think about how to combine these things. So let's say you, you, you know, you're on a, it's a Tuesday. You've done your weight training on Monday. Um, and you want to do your heat and cold. You don't have time to optimize everything perfectly. You could say, okay, I'm going to do my um, heat and cold at 10 a.m. or 8 a.m. You get in the sauna for 20 minutes or so, and then you get into the cold for three minutes. And then you might get into the sauna again for 10 minutes, and you get in the cold for another minute or so. You end on cold. Yes. Why? Because it'll wake you up, and presumably you're not you want to be woken up for the day. That also means don't then, if you're doing it in a facility, don't then go and have a warm shower. Right. Once you finished. Right. Coolish shower is fine because you want to clean off often. I mean, the ice bath is cleanish, but it's, you know, in Dep- the, depends in, where you're going. In laboratories, you're absolutely right. In laboratories, if we want to preserve something, in particular a virus, we put it in the freezer. If you want to kill a virus, you heat it up. This is not. Um, you can have as dirty of a sauna as you want, but the, the cold tub. <laughs> well, the t- yeah, the sauna sort of its own autoclave if it gets hot enough, right? And the cold, cold stuff needs to be cleaned out now and again. You get mold growing in, an, in a freezer which is kind of freaky to think about, but you really can't. It's never going to grow in a sauna. Never going to grow if it, if it gets hot enough. Now, there is what I call the Soberg principle, uh, which is if you are using deliberate cold exposure to increase metabolism, end on cold. So finish on the cold, not just because it wakes you up more, but because then you have to heat your body up naturally, which is a thermogenic metabolic response. So end with cold, and if you really want to push it, you can do things like don't use a towel, use evaporation, uh, spread out your limbs and don't huddle so that you have to shiver more, et cetera. I mean, there are a lot of little games you can play. But let's say you want to reduce post-exercise inflammation. You're not concerned with hypertrophy gains, of, of muscle size gains or strength gains. Well, then get in the cold after your, your workout. Do that for one to, some people can do 10 minutes, reduce inflammation. Let's say you really want to hit growth hormone, which is what you asked. The biggest effects of sauna on growth hormone, and they are big effects, are when the sauna is only done once per week, but it's done in four cycles or sets, we could say, of 30 minutes each. So that means 30 minutes in the sauna at the temperatures I described before, 
then a five minute break, just air cooling off or 10 minute break, then back into the sauna for 30 minutes. This is brutal. Then again in the afternoon, 30 minutes in the sauna, then 10 minutes, just air cooling off and then back into the sauna for 30 minutes. So that's two hours at 187 to 212 degrees. In one day. In one day. With a maximum of what? Less than sort of 20 minutes of rest in between those right. little sessions than the yeah. big rest in between. So you have to be very careful, right? Heat can kill you. You got to hydrate. You need to make sure you get enough salt. Like it, I mean, this is, this is work, right? Um, but you get, you see in these human studies up to 16 fold increases in growth hormone. So you can imagine this could exert some very strong reparative effect if you're training for a big event or endurance event, or, or maybe you're just really wiped out from the week. This is a stressor, but it's a stressor that delivers a potent growth hormone response. Now, if you do sauna more often than that, you're not going to want to do two hours a day in the sauna because presumably you're doing other things. You have a life. You have a life. And in addition to that, the growth hormone effect starts to diminish if you become too heat adapted. And that raises a more interesting question, perhaps, which is why is it that this two-hour protocol really works if you do it once a week to increase growth hormone? It's because it's a stressor, and certain stressors increase growth hormone. Does it have to be heat? No. You could probably also do four really long rounds of ice bath, and I'm guessing you'd probably see a similar effect. No one's ever really looked. You'd probably see a similar effect because it's all about the stress stimulus. Now, those that work on exercise science and weight training would probably say, yeah, you could also do a, this has been shown, you know, a 90 minute, 10 sets of 10, multiple exercises for 10 sets of 10, high volume, German volume training, workout and get the same growth hormone effects. There's so many studies like this. I personally like to do the sauna two or three days a week. And if I'm traveling off and don't get the opportunity, if I'm in Austin, it's great because there are all these sauna places. But if I'm traveling abroad, I don't have the time, then I might do, I might take a day. I'm thinking, wow, I did three podcasts. I'm exhausted. When I'm in New York, I like to go to a place. I have no relation to them, but I think it's called Spa 88. It's a Russian banya. And I'll just go for the whole day. I've, if I've been working really, really hard, they serve food there. They serve borscht and all this other kind of like pickled vegetables. And um, They must think that you're Russian. You, they must, you must walk through the doors and they go, hello, brother. Sometimes. I usually just don't. The best way to, to appear Russian, Lex, I hope you're listening, is to just not say anything. Just, just to nod. That's the most Russian thing that you can say is nothing. <laughs> exactly.